Welcome to the uh, sixth and final press conference of uh, this year's virtual EGU. Uh, so this is obviously a meeting of the European Geosciences Union and this year we have more than 14,000 abstracts and 16,000 people from across the globe participating in the meeting. Uh, so my name is Erin Martin-Jones, this year's EGU press conference assistant and I'll be hosting today's session which will include a question and answer period following on from presentations uh, by all three of our speakers. So to allow members of the media to ask your own questions, we're obviously conducting this as a Zoom meeting. So once the last speaker has uh, finished, please write the letter Q in the chat box to ask a question and I'll call on you to unmute and, and ask your question yourself. Or you're also equally welcome to type your question in the chat box and I can read them out as well. Hopefully this won't happen, but for some reason, if Zoom should quit, uh, we'll just start the press conference and give you all a, a couple of moments to rejoin the session. That's completely fine. Um, and obviously there's lots of good stuff on the media uh, press center for, um, for EGU. So that's media.edu.eu, where you'll find the abstracts and the documents relating to this and the other press conferences we've been doing. So please check there for more information. So I'll introduce our three speakers now, just to make for faster transitions in between them. Uh, so obviously this, this press conference is, is all themed uh, learning from the past, catastrophes, climate and cultural change. And our speakers are first up, Dr. Dagmar de Groot, who is Associate Professor at, at Georgetown University, United States. Uh, second up, we should have Dr. Stephen Powell in the audience. Um, I'm here. Uh, you're here? Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Stephen Powell is Senior Research Fellow at St. Peter's, St. Petersburg State University. And last but not least, we have Dr. James Terry, who is Professor at Zayed University in the United Arab Emirates. So I will now ask our panelists to come forward in, in that order to give a short presentation. And then once we've heard from our three speakers, I'll open up the floor for questions. So I'll just stop sharing and, and Dagmar, you can share your, your slides. Well, thank you so much. Can you all see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, no great. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to join all of you today. Uh, thank you, Terry, for inviting me. I want to introduce you to an article that we recently published in the journal Nature entitled Towards a Better Understanding of Societal Responses to Climate Change. And in this article, we try and coin a transdisciplinary field of study that explores how past climate changes have influenced human history. We call that the History of Climate and Society, or HCS. And this is a field of study that depends on what we call climate proxy sources. Proxy sources are just something that can stand in for instrumental measurements before the instrumental period, so that is before the late 19th century or so. There are proxy sources from the archives of nature, like tree rings and ice cores, that have embedded in their composition the signature of past climate changes. And there are, uh, are proxy sources as well from the archives of society, which are just documents or oral histories or archeological remains that testify to the influence of past climate change. So by combining these different proxy sources, we create reconstructions of past climate change. And that just means graphs or maps that tell us how climate has changed uh, in the past. So here's a reconstruction of the last 2000 years or so. This was created by meteorologist Ed Hawkins using pages 2K data. And of course, the first thing it shows is recent extreme anthropogenic warming, but then it also shows a colder period that began around the 13th century CE and lasted through the 19th century CE called the Little Ice Age, a cooling of a, several tenths of a degree Celsius in the Northern Hemisphere. And it shows another maybe less cold and certainly less long lasting period in the sixth century CE that's recently been coined the late antique Little Ice Age. Okay, so there was quite a bit of 
climatic variability even before the onset of anthropogenic global warming, although it's not as extreme as what's happening now. And that realization, which we can see in reconstructions or gain from reconstructions, is the foundation for HCS scholarship. This scholarship is now pretty big. This is just a smattering of recent publications that mostly focus on the Little Ice Age, mostly written by historians, but we have over 4,000 publications now at the Climate History Network Zotero database, which you can access at climatehistory.net. And that's not even a complete list. So there's a lot of publications and they use diverse methodologies, some of them qualitative, others statistical. The statistical work has tended to focus on Imperial China, but they also have a lot in common. They tend to focus on catastrophe, uh, episodes of societal collapse, as it's called, or just crises that affected past societies because of climate change, the argument goes. This is a graph from our Nature article that focuses on publications written by historians that focus on the Little Ice Age in Europe. So as you can see, there's more and more of these publications, but you can also see that the overwhelming majority focus on catastrophe relative to resilience. And often these publications draw on a selection of case studies that might focus on uh, the collapse of dynasties in ancient Egypt or Viking settlements in Greenland or the classical Maya or Angkor, a whole bunch of different case studies that supposedly show that societies collapsed when climate changed. So there's good reason for this. Societies could be disastrously affected by climate change as I think you'll hear in a few minutes. But we argue in this nature piece that HCS scholarship has suffered from a recurring set of methodological challenges. They might use climate data inappropriately, for example. They might focus on excessively large scales in time and space without considering local relationships. They might use historical primary sources inappropriately at face value or ignore what can't be quantified or pay it insufficient attention to uncertainty. There's a whole bunch of these recurring problems. And what we suggest is a research framework that's really just a selection of questions that researchers should ask themselves that will hopefully allow researchers to overcome these problems. And, and really what we're going for is inspiring researchers to work better with, with each other. It's just been a very multidisciplinary field, but an insufficiently transdisciplinary field, meaning that there are research groups that might involve a token historian or a token scientist, but rarely do you have equal clusters of scholars from different disciplines imagining projects from the ground up. So that is really what we call for. We try and model that approach by examining and unearthing examples of populations that were resilient in the face of past climate changes. And by doing that, we find that there are a number of what we call pathways by which populations could be resilient or adaptive in the face of climate change. You can see the definitions we use for those terms here. We find, for example, that past populations could exploit new opportunities created by local environmental responses to climate change or we find that they could uh, make use of resilient energy systems. So energy systems that did not change when temperature or precipitation changed. We find that resilient populations often drew on diverse resources through intricate trade connections, or that their institutions were particularly flexible, or that they migrated and in migrating transformed themselves to better adapt to a changing climate. And we find all these pathways by examining both the Little Ice Age and the late antique Little Ice Age. The question we have, of course, is what lessons can we learn from these case studies that we can apply to the present? And one lesson would be that we should look beyond collapse when we're considering the past, or even beyond crisis, but should try and unearth more of these examples of resilience because they might have something to teach us about what we should do to adapt to a warmer climate now. And also, I think we should be more transdisciplinary when we conduct climate research. So not just a drawing on one kind of scholarship, but all kinds of different scholarships are necessary to play together in order to tackle these uh, big research topics. Okay, thank you so much. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. De Groot. So um, yeah, once again, if we, if we save the questions up until the end, um, and if we move on now to Dr. Stephen Powell, if you're available, to unmute yourself. 
I'll uh, share my screen now. Okay, can you all see this presentation? Yep, we can see that. Okay, so I'm just gonna um, start. So uh, one of these societies that hasn't been looked at so much uh, is the Mongol Empire and its fall, but it seems connected to the er eruption of Samalas. Uh, just in case you're not familiar with Samalas, uh, it's thought to have happened the eruption took place in late 1257 uh, on Lombok, Indonesia, and the volcano's effects are found in ice core samples all over the earth, but it was only identified positively relatively recently by Frank Levine and all. It's the largest volcanogenic gas injection of the common era, releasing sufficient sulfur and halogen gases into the stratosphere to be responsible for the cooling of the later 1200s. So here's a map we made, uh, Laszlo, Ferenzi, and myself. Uh, showing connections between political events and the breakup of the Mongol Empire and environmental and weather disruptions in the post-eruption period of a few years. And you can see it's a truly glo global moment. Things were happening in Japan and uh, Europe that have been emphasized in literature, but in this middle area, which was in brown, that's the Mongol Empire, and it broke up into these different states where you can see the light brown barriers already by 1260. And we're wondering, how did that happen so soon after the volcano? Could, um, there's two episodes that are very clearly connected. One is this uh, number 13 here, and the next is the civil war up in Mongolia, 22 and 19 and 20, that seem really closely connected to the volcano. So the first, the epidemic of 1259 and the death of the last great Khan, Manka. In 1258-59, he launched a campaign to conquer the Song Empire, the, the pink in China, the unconquered part, um, and so there were three major army groups. The army group in Yunnan of, uh, was struck by an epidemic in 1258. So there's Yunnan, uh, it's Dali, yeah, number 10. And then in 1259, the army group under Monka Khan was similarly struck by an epidemic and the Khan himself died in it. And that started the civil war amongst his relatives. It's a direct connection. But there were many documented uh, epidemics at the same time in England, Iraq, Syria, Korea, we found in China, these seem to be ignored, Japan. And this is, these are always tied to the post-volcanic effects. So here you can see the campaign. The black arrow on the left, that's Manka Khan's, the great Khan's uh, army, and he reaches Diao Yucheng, uh, and he dies there August 11th. Uh, and then below that, you see I in 1258, that's where the epidemic roughly struck the other army group, and it shut down there and almost killed their commander. He was infected. Here's the description of the death of Manka Khan um, in Rashid ad Din's chronicle. When Manka Khan was besieging this place, the water and the air of the place gave rise to an epidemic to ward off the cholera, as Vaba in Persian, and might, it might be a more general term. The world, world emperor began to drink wine and persisted in doing so. Suddenly he had intestinal pains and the disease came to a crisis and he died. Um, the, we found the idea that this could be cholera compelling in an earlier article because it's a waterborne disease carried by uh, plankton and it's endemic to the Bay of Bengal. All the global pandemics in the 1800s and early 1900s, they started there. And after major volcanic eruptions in the early 1800s, uh, there was always a major uh, er epidemic arising in there. Vava in Persian sources in 1259, is, it's describing a diarrheal epidemic, it seems. Vava is now the modern word for, in Persian for cholera. And the fear of drinking water, that's documented in the 1200 sources about this epidemic, but also in 1800 sources in Persia. Using alcohol as a, as a way of avoiding the disease or even treating it, that's found in 1200 sources on this epidemic, mystery epidemic, and it's found in 1800 sources. But you might say, uh, could, um, could Bengal, if there, if there was a hypothetical cholera outbreak, could it reach Sichuan? a couple of years later after this volcano, a, a year or so. And there was in fact this major trade route network uh, from Bengal to Sichuan that intersected Dali in the, in the Middle Ages, the horse tea road. Uh, Marco Polo, this big road here, this big red one, he describes the exact route from the Khan's capital, now Beijing, uh, to Bengal. Uh, and again, I designed this with a co-author, Latsi, Latsi Frenzi. Um, but the second point is the climate effects also influenced who won the civil war. So Manka Khan's brothers go to war after he dies. One's based in the steppe up in Mongolia, 
and Kublai Khan was based in China, which seems to have been more resilient. Dagomar was just mentioning this resilience and uh, but the steppes, on the other hand, were, were really ruined by drought in the aftermath, and it absolutely destroyed Eric Boca's war effort. Um, the volcano erup volcanic eruptions do trigger this drought in North China and Mongolia, and uh, um, the capital was moved from Karakorum in Mongolia to Khan Balak at the, in 1260, which happens to be a very bad year of drought, as evinced by the proxy data, uh, Peterson et al. in an important article. and. Uh, that's documented in the sources all across northern China, Mongolia, drought, famine during the civil war, and it really hampered the steppe forces efforts. So here's just the conclusions, the takeaway. Samalas has been ignored as an influencer on the Mongol Empire's dissolution, despite records of environmental weather and epidemic havoc in the years after 1257, especially the immediate years with the epidemics. The volcano is one piece of a complex pack. Uh, picture involving human choices, social factors, resilience again. It's not so cut and dried that this is a deterministic relationship. There are human choices. Monkey Khan chose to invade uh, and besiege Diao Cheng, even when he was warned by an advisor that there was southern epidemics. He just chose to ignore it and he died. Uh, but uh, so it's not it's not completely the volcano destroyed the Mongol Empire. But to leave this out of this discussion, when we see this data, uh, including the proxy data mixed with the source data, which hasn't been heavily emphasized, this is an important picture of how these important historical events that had real global consequences um, were influenced by the environment. And these things can serve as a reminder in our own time, perhaps a warning. So thank you very much for your Thank you, Stephen. Um, so let's now move on to, to James, Dr. James Terry, if you're about. Yes, I'm here. Thank, thank you, you for the introduction and, and thank you, Terry, for the invitation. Um, please let me know once you can see the screen. Yeah, we've got your screen. Okay, well, this work is essentially a case study that has been carried out um, in 2018 in a, in a very remote part of the Pacific, in fact, in the, in the northern Gilbert Islands of, of Kiribati. Now, in terms of, uh, of paleo tsunami studies, the, the vast central and western Pacific region is somewhat of an intriguing anomaly because although it's potentially exposed to tsunamis that could be generated around the entire Pacific Rim. In fact, the entire Central and Western Pacific lacks dated paleo tsunami records. Uh, and, and as far as we're aware, there, there are none, in fact, that have been, have been dated uh, compared to many that have been dated around the Pacific Rim. Now, um, Kiribati is one of the atoll nations. There are five what are called atoll nations, nations that are entirely made up of, of atoll islands, these low-lying islands of often uh, dispersed across vast uh, regions. And uh, you can see from the images here that these islands are essentially long, narrow islands that uh, encircle a, a shallow central lagoon. The particular islands that we're interested in are the, um, are the atoll of Butaritari in the northern Gilberts. And, uh, and, and small Makin Island, which is, which is north of, uh, of, of Butaritari. And you can see that it's just north of the equator, uh, about three degrees north, and, uh, and, and only covers really a few uh, square kilometers, but it does support um, a population of, of a few thousand people. Now, we became aware of, um, of named megaclasts. A megaclast is essentially a giant block of uh, reef rock that has been transported uh, usually by waves up onto the reef platform. And uh, we, we were told about uh, several that had been mapped and, and had names. So um, I was invited by a former student uh, who now works for the, um, for the Ministry of um, uh, Re Mineral Resource Development and Fisheries. His name is Robert Carroro and, and he's there. And uh, we visited Makin in, uh, in July 2018 for a, for a short visit uh, to have a look at these, these megaclasts. And, and, and here you can see them, the two named ones. There's Rebua, uh, 
and uh, and Tokia. Tokia is the one over here on on the right, and Mibura is, is is on the left. And uh, th these really are huge. I mean, these are some of the biggest reef blocks, the biggest mega class that I've seen um, on on the reef flat. And in fact, they're so big that, that they are the the highest land on on the island. You know, uh, this one here is six meters tall. It's always above uh, above the tide or whatever stage of the tide um, uh, you're at. And, uh, and, and we measured this one and we measured the others. And we, we, we're we pretty certain that we can identify these as paleo tsunami evidence, because for a start, making is outside the tropical cyclone belt. You know, elsewhere in, in the Pacific, of course, you have both the North and South Pacific cyclone belts that uh, periodically we see very large cyclones such as Fiji in the last few years, there's been extremely intense cyclones, but near the equator, these events don't occur. And, and these, these mega clasts have, have been rolled along. Uh, we know that because within them, you have fossil corals, which are not in their growth orientation. There are both inverted corals in one of the blocks and there are sideways oriented corals in, um, in another one of these named blocks. So this is, is pretty certainly evidence of wave transport by, by possibly lifting and also by, by rolling. Uh, there's even one which, which is not on the platform, it's just offshore and it, it was pointed out to us and it, it's distinctly separated from the, from the reef by a, a sort of narrow chasm here. So we, we had a look at this one just offshore as well. And what you can do is, of course, because these are made of coral, you can take fragments and send them off for, for dating. We used uranium thorium dating, which essentially uh, naturally occurring uranium, which is co-precipitated in the coral while it's alive. Once it dies, it then turns slowly into thorium and it works as a, as a fairly precise um, atomic clock. The thing, of course, is the accuracy and the precision of the measurement are not quite the same thing. In terms of accuracy, if you want to know when this rock was deposited, we are assuming the coral within it died when it was thrown up by the waves. But of course, you have to know which is the youngest end of, of this very large deposit. So we use the corals to help us and we can identify which is the youngest end of the, of the, of the boulder. And, and from that, um, uh, you know, that our colleague um, Annie Lau in the University of Queensland, um, you know, dated this in her lab. And the youngest date we have is AD uh, 1576. So it can't be older than that. It could potentially be younger, but we think that we've sampled the youngest part of the, of the boulder. Now, um, one of the most difficult things to, to measure, believe it or not, is, is the volume of these things, because of course they're, they are an irregular shape. So uh, Professor Gennady Gianko, our, our co-worker in the University of Alaska, uh, from a set of photographs that I took around the boulder, uh, did modeling and, and was able to determine the, the volume of the largest one. So Ribura rock really is a huge uh, mega clast and uh, you know, it, it's over 90 meters cubed and probably in the region of, of 170 tons or possibly bigger because people tell us that a, a smaller one next to it, which is unnamed, um, was at one time joined with it and, and has since split off. Now, um, from, from the size of these things, you can use what are called hydrodynamic flow transport equations that you can then model the estimated minimum flow velocity of the water that would have been required to move these and from that, depending on whether you're thinking of rolling mode or lifting mode, the speed of the water flow would have had to have been a minimum of between seven and 16 meters per second, which is, which is pretty fast compared to other similar work we've done on storm deposited boulders um, elsewhere in the, uh, in the Pacific. We, we're pretty certain that the wave must have come from the west. Why do we say that? Well, because Ribura is the largest of the rocks and it's closer to this coast Tokia has been transported further away from the coast, about 150 meters or so. So we're certain the wave, or fairly certain the wave came from the west rather than the other side of, of, of the reef. Um, now, we were lucky when we were there to, to be introduced. This was entirely um, by chance, uh, serendipity came into play. A, a, a chap here who has the official position of, of Winte Maniaba, and that means that he is the traditional storyteller on making island. 
apparently not every island in Kiribati has uh, a traditional storyteller, but, but Makin has one. It's a hereditary position that's passed down. And, and this chap uh, has the responsibility of, of um, passing down to the, the generation beyond the traditional stories, oral history, legends, and, and myths of, of his island. And it's essentially a, a way of archiving um, events from the past and things to do with genealogy and, and such like. So he was a very uh, a friendly chap and he came with us out to the reef and he was willing to tell us the story of three giant waves that occurred in the past. So this was wonderful because this was a, a chance to, to, to overlap and to marry evidence both from anthropology and also from geoscience. And the story was, was interpreted by again another colleague of ours, Marta uh, Vitorek from, from my university. And the story goes that uh, a, a chap called Baranto, who may have been a chief, uh, was angered for, for some reason, and he sent three giant waves in, in retribution. Uh, of course, the story doesn't tell us when this occurred, but the oral history preserves what we think is credible evidence supporting a tsunami hypothesis, because it doesn't contain any information about stormy conditions, about dark, dark skies, or, or, or other kinds of things to do with the weather, which these stories normally do. Um, also, the story doesn't contain any information about any rumbling or shaking of the ground. Again, this information would normally be preserved in these sorts of, of legends and oral histories. So we think that um, this is what you might call a, a, an orphan tsunami because it, it didn't have an accompanying large earthquake. And this is essentially the model of, of how we believe that the, the edge of the reef crest was broken and, and carried on to the shore or the reef platform to to produce these, these mega clasps. So, um, so what do we think caused this, uh, this tsunami then in the, in the late 1500s, in the 16th century? Well, um, of course, around the Pacific um, Rim, there is um, subduction zone seismicity. In other words, very large earthquakes, as we're, we're all aware with the, um, with the 2004 tsunami, the Boxing Day tsunami, and also with the um, the 2011 Tohoku tsunami in, in Japan, there's seismically driven, earthquake driven tsunamis. Um, there, there have been records of events in the 1400s, but this is about 100 years too early for, for our event, if our dating is correct. Uh, likewise, there was a catastrophic volcanic eruption in um, the mid 1400s um, in Vanuatu. A, a huge volcano blew itself to pieces. Uh, but again, with both of these possibilities, the dates are not quite right. They occurred about 100 years too early, and we're not sure if, if the waves would have been energetic enough to, to have reached uh, thousands of kilometers away in, in Kiribati and, and, and thrown up these huge blocks. So what we think instead is likely is that this is an example of um, uh, submarine landslide failure off the coast that generated a local large tsunami. And we think that this probably happened in, along this steep bathymetry offshore of making in, in this kind of direction. So, so what this means then is that uh, this has implications for understanding the, the, the paleo tsunami history of the Central and Western Pacific, which at the moment has a scarcity of information. This kind of work needs to, needs to continue. And what it tells us, of course, is that there's exposure and there's risk, in addition to the threats of sea level rise, of course, which these countries are, uh, are facing at the moment. But, but just as important, it, it, it helps to highlight also the, the value of indigenous environmental knowledge to help um, add to the, 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 the information we can gain from geoscience. And together, this, this enables us to have a much better picture of, of disaster risk in, in some of these remote and potentially extremely vulnerable low-lying islands in the, in the Central Pacific. Thank you for listening. I'll stop there. Thank you, James, and to all, all three of our speakers for their, for their great presentations. Um, so I'll open up the floor now for some questions. So, of course, you're welcome to write your question in full in the chat or, or just type the letter Q and we can come around to you um, to ask your question yourself. So any questions? <laughs> 
So we have one from Sarah Derwin um, and she says, great talks. Um, this is a question for all the speakers. It seems to be, uh, it seems that most of the research tends to focus on catastrophes rather than resiliency. Do you think that this is a product of the geological record preserving upheaval or is this because of the human nature of human nature? Are we fascinated by chaos and destruction? So I can, uh, I can start answering that one. This is actually a focus in our nature article as well, where we explore that question. I think part of the reason, there are several, but part of the reason is that when HCS scholars begin research projects, they're often trying to explain a particularly extreme event in the past. So let's say uh, the disappearance of one of these Viking settlements in Greenland, right? Why did that happen? This question has prompted a great deal of scholarship uh, because it seemed to coincide with the start of the Little Ice Age. Right? So they're, they're trying to work backwards to explain disasters that have happened. And, um, and so that I think accounts for a lot of this focus um, on disaster. Thank you, Dagmar. And I would add that uh, the sources themselves, the historical sources often describe, uh, you know, in very, maybe even hyperbolic terms, or at least in very florid, fl florid kind of terms, they describe these human disasters and catastrophes as a result of the epidemic, for instance, that, that destroyed the last great con of the unified empire. And there's a, 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 a sense of kind of horror that you feel at any time that you read about this, that how nature can overwhelm even the, the greatest armies of the time and, the, and, and can break apart the greatest states of the period, and reduce kings and everything to, uh, you know, victims of these, of these catastrophes. So that, that has a certain pull on, on the reader. That's a really good point. Actually, when you're looking at resilience, so often you're looking at something that effectively isn't there, right? If you're looking at disaster, in the past, disasters can be very well documented. And, and <laughs> you know, with resilience, it's often what didn't happen, right? So it's, it can be harder to kind of wrap your mind around that and to find the sources for uh, writing a project about that. That reminds me, um, uh, Martin Boak noticed around the time of 1258, there's a lot of accounts of bridge repairs in Germany. In the, so you know something bad happened to the bridge, <laughs> but, you, but what you rather read about is the repair, but that's not so interesting to a reader. James, any final comments on that one or? Uh, well, I mean, I think both the, both Stephen and Dagmar have answered that question very well. The you know studying um, disaster risk and uh, and disaster risk reduction, of course, which is the focus of the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction, very important UN framework. You know, to understand how we can improve resilience, you, you must understand how the hazard works and the processes first, and then you need to understand the the level of exposure uh, as well. But certainly, um, in the person who asked the question, Sarah, is absolutely right. There needs to be a focus on, on resilience building as well. Certainly in the Pacific, actually, people are remarkably resilient. They have all kinds of, uh, of wonderful systems in place, you know, kinship, a, a tradition of helping each other in times of, of calamity. And so actually, uh, some of this indi these indigenous methods are, are to be admired. Um, but, you know, studying disasters and studying disaster risk reduction need, needs all of these things combined. It needs an understanding of the geoscience of the hazards, and then it needs an understanding of, of levels of exposure. And then how can society, you know, both use traditional resiliency, but also develop new solutions, you know, often nature-based solutions to help us adapt uh, into the future. Um, I would add one more thing. Um, I think there has been, maybe assumption is too strong, but the kinds of models I would say that HCS scholars have used of causation have tended to assume that the most direct impacts of climate change on past populations have been through growing seasons and harvests and grain prices. And of course, if you use that assumption, then you will always tend to focus your research projects on periods of very high grain prices. Um, and those periods are often closely associated with disaster. So another kind of going back to the sources a little bit, but also now thinking about the methods um, and the models that scholars use. Uh, 
um, focusing on all your research on these periods of high grain prices also tends to bias the analysis towards disaster. Sari, I, I noticed your question, but uh, if James and Stephen want to add something else, so shut up for a second. Well, I, that's a good question, Terry. I, I think that you know we're all responsible for communicating uh, what we can, um, you know, to, to help with with disaster risk reduction, and and journalism certainly, you know, and journalists need need to play their part as well. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think what's often the case is, is that, you know, the the resilience is not maybe so newsworthy as as the impacts. You know, in, impacts make news, and, and this, as you say, is, is, is sort of what people want to see. Um, but, but certainly, I think academics and uh, I think journalists and, uh, and and anybody that has any kind of knowledge or understanding that can be shared should uh, should do what they can to to increase awareness. And and the example shown in, in Kiribati there in the Gilbert Islands, I think, is a, is a wonderful one where where somebody actually has the responsibility to pass down indigenous knowledge of of events that were not written down, you know, from hundreds of years ago to make sure that future generations are aware that that there have been giant waves. Of course, you know, they're they're not really or necessarily aware, you know, of what caused such events. Uh, you know, what generated tsunamis, and so stories are embellished and people make their own interpretations. But the important point is that, that the knowledge of the event itself and the kinds of damage that it caused, uh, you know, I didn't tell you everything about the stories in that particular case, but, you know, the, the giant waves were meant to have, um, to have caused a fair bit of damage and geomorphic change. In fact, uh, one island was separated from a larger island, and so there was a sort of reconfiguration of the coastline, if you want to think of it like that. And, and that information has been passed on without any uh, written uh, record uh, successfully over centuries. And I think that's, that's quite remarkable. And so, you know, I, I think we can learn a lot from these kinds of traditional methods of making sure that knowledge isn't, isn't lost. So uh, here's what I would say in answer to those questions. And, and our article in Nature kind of partly addresses them. But first, how researchers can work better with each other. Well, the first thing is that researchers have to realize they should work with each other, right? So right now, a common problem in this field is that you might have historians or archaeologists who think they can use the paleoclimatic evidence for past climate change, but might misuse that evidence. And then you might have paleoclimatologists who want to use the historical or archaeological evidence, but they might misuse it as well. For example, they might rely on accessible data sets without realizing that those data sets for historical change are not comprehensive. So as you could probably tell from my presentation and from the other presentations, this is a highly it has to be a transdisciplinary field, right? We're talking about science, the science of reconstructing these past climate changes, but then also the humanities and social science that goes into figuring out the impacts of those past climate changes on human populations. So you can't just assume that you know it all, <laughs> is what I would say to, uh, to colleagues. You have to try and work in research teams. Now, what does that look like? Often research teams are flawed because you might have 10 scientists who decide to invite one historian into the research team to figure out human impacts, right? And if you do that, you automatically marginalize the perspective of the historian. So that's not right either. What you should really do is get together groups of people that are relatively equal in terms of the discipline that they represent. So let's say three paleoclimatologists, three historians, three archeologists get together and start working on a research project from the ground up. I think that's a, a pretty good best practice. It's not the only way of doing this, um, but it is, I think, an, a, a good way of doing it. I'll put it that way. Um, in terms of the role that journalists can play in communicating a message of resilience, well, so I've worked a lot with uh, journalists and a lot with public outreach. And one thing I find is that the discourse is so polarized these days, right? On the one hand, you have uh, terrifying stories of potential extremes in the future, which may well happen, by the way, but there's been a real focus on that and on uh, scenarios called RCP 8.5 or SSP 8.5, the most extreme apocalyptic scenarios of our future. That's very common. And there's some reason for that, of course. Um, but on the other hand, you've got 
you know, kind of the fringe climate deniers who still occupy way too much space here in the United States and, and I would say globally as well. But what you don't have nearly enough of, I would argue, is more nuanced stories sort of in between. And those kinds of stories are, I think, most common when you look into the past. You find all kinds of examples of, as Stephen puts it, not just big environmental changes, but also populations deciding how they respond to those changes and the impacts of environmental changes kind of being mediated and filtered through uh, social structures. So I think one of the big lessons of the past is that this stuff is complicated. Unless climate change, of course, becomes too extreme, and generally impacts on populations are uh, nuanced, and there's lots of examples of resilience and adaptation, sometimes in societies that are actually vulnerable to climate change. So it's really, really complicated to tease these things out. And what I wish for the media is that the media would focus more on these kind of complex stories. From my experience, there is a real public appetite for that kind of content. And I think, uh, I think it would be wonderful if the media assumed that the public would be interested in stories that go beyond these two extremes. Uh, thanks, Sarah. You um, you mentioned uh, why do I why, why do we think it's cholera? And um, the truth is, with medieval diseases, um, how they understand them, the terminology they use, <clears throat> and often their really vague descriptions mean that a lot of literature can be spent just trying to figure out what or offer suggestions for what the disease was. But why cholera is so compelling? It doesn't have to be cholera for to imagine this was affected by the volcano but because there were a lot of epidemics. There was one in England that um, there's a huge mass grave in London that was found related to this 1258 environmental disaster. So epidemics can strike a, a vulnerable, worn down, stressed out, uh, hungry population in cold or disruptive weather. This can just, it doesn't have to be cholera, but cholera is compelling because the response to it, the, the wine drinking, um, this exactly matches what an English observer in Persia saw in 1820 during the so-called first cholera pandemic. When it reached Persia, immediately the people had these set methods of uh, whether they were allowed to or not, they were drinking all the alcohol they could find. And evidently it's to avoid water. Uh, Rashid ad din writing about Monka Khan's reason for drinking wine plainly says it's to avoid water. And, uh, in the 1800s, what you find too is that when, when cholera first reached Europe, in Austria-Hungary, the Surgeon Corps, um, basically they uh, disinfected all the, all the wells across Austro-Hungary. And there was a, a lot of suspicion in the Persian sources too from the 1800s that do not drink water from still bodies of water. If you have to drink water, drink it uh, over water that flows over stones. Uh, or drink alcohol. And this is even Islamic authors would say this, and it, it went against their prohibition on alcohol. So the fact that this uh, 1800s literature in Persia, and they call it Baba, just like uh, that became the word cholera in Persian. I don't know if it was when Rashid ad din used it in the 12, 1300s, but that did become the Persian word for cholera. So there's just, and, and there's a, a description of diarrhea and fear of drinking water and terminology of intestinal cramps. So uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of reasons to think it's cholera. It doesn't have to be, but that's what I thought is a better suggestion than black death or malaria. Okay, Sarah says thank you. Um, are there any more questions for our panelists? Could I just add one really last quick point? After sure. volcanic eruptions in the 1800s, like Tambora erupted in 1815, 1817, a massive cholera ep epidemic started in the Bay of Bengal and it radiated across Asia and into, you know, that was the start of the first cholera pandemic. But in the 1830s, there were two major uh, climate forcing volcanic eruptions as well. And like clockwork, a year or two after, major cholera epidemic in the Bay of Bengal. So until they really started to get cholera under control in the, in the mid 1800s, that starts to skew things because now it's not happening in the same way. They have quarantines and these massive measures to control cholera, whether they understood it or not. But when big volcanoes happened in the early 1800s, what we definitely know is cholera would always have a 
outburst in the Bay of Bengal, and that has to do with probably with the heating of the Bay of Bengal, the increase in plankton population, and, and the stress on the population, hunger, drought, weather disruptions. Sorry about that, but yeah, that's that's the reason. That's fine. Thank you for adding that point. Um, any, anything else for our panelists? Any more questions? Okay, well, I think we can leave it there, but I'd like to say thank you to our panelists uh, for this really interesting discussion and for taking the time out to present to us. And also for all of our uh, journalists that have attended as well. Um, so we'll finish there. And this obviously marks the final press conference uh, of EGU. Hopefully next year we can welcome you to Vienna in person. Um, but other than that, you can find all of our press conferences for uh, EGU so far um, on our YouTube channel. So check out there and all of the materials, as I said, on our press centre online.